I'm gonna do the seemingly impossible today. I'm gonna build a completely fanless, fully maintenance-free, passively cooled PC with parts that are all in stock right now. And to add to the impossible, I'm gonna enclose it all in a case. Many have tried, most, including me, have failed. Let's do this. When I'm doing tedious work, like hours of benchmarking, I like to catch up on my reading list, and I'm able to do that with Audible Plus. Audible Plus offers access to thousands of best-selling audiobooks, Audible Originals, and even podcasts. As an Audible Premium Plus member, this month I selected Star Wars Thrawn Ascendancy by Timothy Zahn as one of my two monthly free bonus titles to keep. For more information about Audible Plus, or to get your free trial, click the link in the description below. Hey guys, welcome to Elevated Systems. I'm your host CJ, and just a couple of weeks ago, I did a comprehensive review of the cooling performance of the Noctua NHP1 passive CPU cooler, and because a single component and SFX power supply didn't show up, I wasn't able to finish the video with the passively cooled PC build that I planned on. So I improvised and actually ended up building a cool little HTPC, but it wasn't fanless because there was a fan in the power supply. And of course the PC wasn't completely maintenance free because it's completely open. So especially here in the high desert plains of Colorado, the giant heat sink is going to get dusty. So I went back to the planning phase and I'll just say building a completely passive PC isn't as straightforward as a normal PC and building a completely passive gaming PC is virtually impossible right now, which means today I'll be building a completely passive, maintenance-free and very capable home office productivity type PC. I've built several of these types of PCs on the channel and they're pretty popular, mostly because these types of PCs account for over 85% of all PC sales. Almost all of the most popular like Office Depot type selection of pre-built PCs, your Dells, HP, Lenovo's, etc., don't have dedicated graphics card or have a GPU that's just there to output a video signal like a GT710. And all those business desktop PCs are solid options for the majority of PC users. You bring it home, stick it under your desk, and it does what you need it to do. But eventually it starts to get louder and it starts to slow down because those fans are sucking in dirt, dust, and pet hair, causing the system to heat up, which makes the fans, which are now laden with dust, to spin faster, and eventually you just have a slow, nasty PC that needs a deep cleaning. So the plan today is to build a PC you can stick under your desk and forget about. No moving parts, no dust accumulation, and it'll do everything you need a desktop PC to do. Productivity, content consumption, content creation, and even some casual gaming. Once we get it built, I'll test it out under realistic conditions to see what type of performance we can get. And most importantly, can the system stay cool enough to maintain that performance? But the first order of business is unboxing and introducing all the components I selected for this build. And first is the star of the show and what makes the whole build possible, the Noctua NHP1 passive CPU cooler. Like I said, I did a comprehensive review of this and it surprised me as it passed every test I threw at it. Six heat pipes, 13 1.5 millimeter thick aluminum heat dissipation fins, 2.6 pounds, and no fans needed. However, if you want to go semi-passive, there are three mounting points for a 120 millimeter fan, but we're not doing that today. Next is the Seasonic 450 watt 80 plus titanium fanless power supply. The PSUs in those pre-built systems I talked about are usually the first components to die. The fan sucks in dust, the internal components overheat, and poof, 
no more power supply. More often than not, the fan in those PSUs actually dies. This one first is Seasonic, which in my opinion is the premium power supply manufacturer. No moving parts to fail, and the titanium rating means it's 94% efficient at 115 volts and 96% on 230 volts at 50% load, so only 4 to 6% of the power the PSU draws is lost to heat. And it's also fully modular, so I only need to use the cables I need. And if anything ever goes wrong, it comes with a 12-year warranty, and it looks pretty cool. <laughs> cool. Get it? Never, never mind. Dad joke. Okay, probably the hardest thing to find at a reasonable cost, the case. This is the SK. TCS200 micro ATX case. I've never heard of this case or even this brand, but according to the stats, it meets all the requirements for a passively cooled PC. I hope the stats are correct or this is going to be a, a fail video. This actually just arrived. I haven't even seen it, so I guess we'll see it together. So let's get it out of the box and see if it's going to work. First thing, this is a gorgeous case. The front and right panels are anodized aluminum and the top panel is the same brushed aluminum with a fine mesh steel insert. Now, the one area I had a compromise when selecting this case was the glass side panel. I wanted a case with a full metal side panel, but I couldn't find one that would either fit the cooler or at a reasonable cost. Even this was pricey at $129, but if you consider the cost of aluminum these days, it's actually not that bad. But the glass will reflect a lot of the heat back into the case where say an aluminum panel would absorb and radiate much of the heat out to the outside environment. Also, the power button and front I.O. are on the front, which is great if you're sticking this PC under your desk, easy to find and use, and it includes a 20 gigabyte per second USB-C 3.2 Gen 2x2 connector, so bonus. But let's get it open so I can show you what I hope makes this a great case for a passively cooled PC. Now, how does it actually open so it looks like the top panel slides oh just slides back and off nice and then the side panel should just slide up yep and off so it's it's pretty much just like the lian lee pco 11 dynamic so this is a micro atx case i went with matx because i'm not using a dedicated graphics card if I was, I'd go with an ATX, so there would be more volume for the components. But the biggest reason I picked this case is the bottom to top airflow. As the giant Noctua heatsink heats up the air in the case, that heated air will rise out of the top of the case and cool air will be drawn in from the bottom of the case. Natural convection. Also, the PSU mounts here in the front top of the case, so it won't interfere with the convection and can use the same convection to keep itself cool. There is a single fan in the rear of the case. I will be removing that. And it does look like there's definitely the 165 millimeters of clearance for the CPU cooler that I'll need. So. The build hopefully will go well in here, but let's move on to the core components of the PC. So the CPU I'm going with is the Intel i5-11400. It's a six core, 12 thread CPU with integrated UHD 730 graphics. Now I went with the entry level 11400 because well, I had it on hand, but you can go with an 11500 or 11600 because Right now, they're all about the same price. As for performance, for most common desktop productivity applications, the average PC user 
won't see a difference in performance. However, if you do more content creation work, video editing, basic 3D design, then the frequency boost and upgraded UHD 750 graphics in the 11500 or 11600 will be beneficial. You'll also get a 5 to 10% boost in gaming from the upgraded CPUs and all three of the 11th gen i5s are on Noctua's supported list. Now, the motherboard is also on the supported list and it's the ASRock B560M Steel Legend. So it is a micro ATX board to match the case and it has the features we want for a passive PC. First, even though I will be limiting the CPU to its 65 watt power limit, the motherboard VRMs will still get hot and these do have some moderate heat sinks to help dissipate the heat. There's also an included heat sink for the M.2 slot. It also has the USB 3.2 Gen 2x2 connector and a Gen 1 connector so I can connect all my front panel IO and a second Ultra M.2 slot, which brings me to my SSDs because I have two. Now that top M.2 slot is a PCIe Gen 4 slot, but Gen 4 NVMe drives tend to run hotter and I wanna limit the heat in that area of the PC. So for the boot drive, I'm using a 256 gigabyte Gen 3 Western Digital NVMe M.2 SSD. And in the bottom M.2 slot, I'll be installing a one terabyte Sabrent Rocket Gen 3 NVMe SSD as my data or storage drive. 250 gigabytes should be plenty for the operating system and software applications. You can go bigger if you need to, and then you have one terabyte for all your documents, photos, data, and media. Having your personal data on a separate SSD than your OS is always a good idea. If anything ever goes wrong with your OS, you can just reinstall it without worrying about losing your personal files, and it's easier to back up that entire storage drive. And finally, I have a two by 16 gigabyte kit of Team Group DDR4 3200 megahertz CL16 memory. Now, 32 gigabytes is a bit overkill for most users. The general rule of thumb for how much memory you need is two gigabytes per CPU thread. This is a 12 thread CPU, but 24 gigs of memory isn't really a thing anymore because you also want equal capacities of memory per channel. So if you're just doing productivity Activity stuff like Office 365 work, web browsing, content consumption like streaming video or music, then 16 gigabytes is enough. However, again, if you're doing content creation or want to do a little like gaming, then because the integrated graphics in the CPU shares the system memory, I'd go with the 32 gigs. So this type of build, I'd usually do a step-by-step -step build guide, but because I want to focus more on the system performance and thermals, I'll just montage the build. If you're interested in how to build a basic PC like this step-by-step, -step, I'll link my build guides in the description below. I'll also link my guides on how to set up a PC and install the operating system after you're done building it. But let's just get the building.
All right, it's actually the next day after I assembled the PC, I spent most of the night testing it out and I'll get to that in a bit. First, I wanna go over a few build notes. First and most importantly, everything including the NHP one fit in the case. I mean, just barely fit. There's only a few millimeters between the heat sink and glass, but it fit. No problems with the full ATX power supply in the case, but if you're using this case, you'll need to plug the case power extension cord in before you screw the PSU in because once it's mounted, the cable won't fit through the pass through for it. The only other issue I had with the case was the cable management as there's not much room behind the right side panel for cables. This is also a good time to mention that for testing the system, I installed a two terabyte, 2.5 inch SSD behind the motherboard because it's preloaded with all my game library and benchmarking software. And because of that, I had to use a SATA power cable. Now there is room inside the case for excess cables, but I didn't want to impede the natural convection at all. So I was able to get all the cables behind the motherboard tray, mostly in the small channel, but over here, there's almost no room and even the extra SATA connectors gave me a little problem while trying to reattach the panel, but I got it done. And finally, the system looks awesome. The brushed aluminum case does look premium sleek, but the hard angles in the very rectangular case complements the massive industrial looking Noctua heatsink. And although I said I wanted a metal side panel, while I was testing, the glass stayed cool all the way up to about the top of the cooler. So I don't think it adversely affected cooling at all. Now, I said I designed this PC so you could just stick it under your desk and just forget about it. So that's how I tested it. I brought it down and stuck it under my old desk that I built about 10 years ago. Now, when I say under your desk, I don't mean on the floor. No PC, especially one that relies on fresh air from the bottom, should go directly on the floor. If you don't have a shelf for it like my desk, then a stand of some sort to keep it several inches off the floor and especially carpet should be used. As far as testing, I began by locking the CPU to its PL1 power limit of 65 watts, but after a 10 minute Cinebench run, the temp peaked at just 60 degrees Celsius, which was just 39 above ambient. So I decided to just unlock the power limits and let the CPU run up to its max PL2 limit of 154 watts. Just FYI, the i5-11400 has a base frequency TDP or power limit of 65 watts and then a PL2, which is a power limit during boost of 154 watts that it can draw for a very brief period. As far as testing, I probably spent four or five hours testing the system and I just ran a bunch of tests that would basically stress the system in a realistic way. So. Here are the results of some of those tests, and I think it's easiest to represent this in a chart. So the benchmarks or tests I ran are listed down the left column. I did include the scores for the more techie folks watching, but more importantly, I included both the actual CPU temp and temp above ambient for each of the tests. And as you look at these results, keep in mind, the maximum operating temp of the 11400 is 100 degrees Celsius. At that point, the CPU will throttle itself to bring the temp down. And I can tell you, the CPU never throttled during any of my testing. The first one I wanna highlight is PC Mark 10, which is a benchmark that tests how the PC performs in basic home computing tasks video conferencing, web browsing, document writing and spreadsheets, photo and video editing, and so on. And it doesn't just simulate these things like say Geekbench, it actually uses a script, opens and works in the applications. So this is the best indicator of the types of temps you'll see in your day-to-day -day computing tasks. And the 75 degrees while still 25 degrees under max temp is a bit misleading because the temp was staying in the mid 60s until the very last part of the test, which is a 3D visualization and rendering test, which is a very CPU intensive task and one that many average PC users 
won't typically be doing, but if you do, there's still plenty of thermal headroom in the system. You can also see that with the 13 minute blender render, which only peaked at 74 degrees Celsius. I used Heaven as a test for the integrated graphics and the CPU package only topped out at 37 degrees above ambient. Also, you see idle temps were on average about 23 degrees above ambient. However, getting back to idle temps after running a test, it obviously take a bit longer than an active cooler would, but the temp does drop from say 75 degrees actual temp down to like 55 almost instantaneously and it takes about five minutes or so to drop down to the 45C mark because, you know, physics, convection. The hotter the heat sink is, the faster it cools. It heats the surrounding air faster, which rises faster and is replaced with cool air faster. As the metal cools, that all slows down, slowing the cooling. <laughs> Sorry, I regressed into my former life as a physics instructor. Anyway, I did some more testing, so I played some games, all of which I'm bad at, but run well on this system, so Fortnite, CSGO, and to a lesser extent Rainbow Siege 6 were all playable, and after almost an hour of play, temps peaked at right around 54C above ambient. Now, again, this isn't necessarily a gaming PC, but if you want to jump into a round of Valorant between video conferences, well, you can. Finally, for the true enthusiasts out there who may be questioning the system's stability, I did run Prime 95 small FFTs, and after an hour, all 12 threads were still running, and temps only peaked at 83 degrees, or 62C above ambient. Now, granted, to really determine stability, Prime 95 should go for like 24 hours or more, but first, the system was completely heat soaked, so max temp wasn't gonna rise more than maybe a degree or two as the room warmed a bit, and in my experience, at stock settings, no overclock. If it's stable after an hour, it's not gonna throw errors until you get to the like 72 hours or more period where your non-ECC memory can start flipping bits and you encounter P95 rounding errors, but that doesn't have anything to do with heat. And a modern Intel CPU can operate pretty much indefinitely at 83 degrees Celsius. Finally, the other components, the SSD, it never passed 40 degrees Celsius, which is 30 degrees under its max operating temp. So if you wanted to go with like a Gen 4 NVMe there, it should be no problem. I didn't really have a good way to measure the PSU temp. I obviously didn't want to stick a thermal couple in there. So I went with the caveman approach. Uh, not hot. Literally, this side of the case didn't heat up at all. I was a bit concerned that the Noctua may radiate heat into the PSU, causing it to heat up more than it would otherwise, but honestly, the heat the system was putting out was just limited to right here above the heat sink, so it was working exactly as it was designed. Plus, the PSU was only pulling under 200 watts at max, so it wasn't having to work hard and generated almost no heat. Now, the only caveat I have to my testing is the ambient temp down in my family room is a little cool for a typical home at 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 Celsius, but it's not like freezing cold. However, ambient temp will affect the cooling potential of the NHP one more so than an active cooler. So if your ambient temps are a bit high, like in the 80s or above, or I guess in the high 20s and Celsius, then you may need to consider lowering that PL2 power limit. However, again, for most typical computing tasks, you'll be just fine. Also, you don't wanna stick the PC on top of like a heating vent or next to like a baseboard heater. That's no good for a passive PC. But there you have it, a completely silent, no moving parts, maintenance-free, very capable desktop PC that looks good enough to put on your desktop or stick under your desk and just use. There are links to all the components in the description below. In all, as of today, the total cost for this is about $1,100 US, which is admittedly a bit pricey for a home office PC, but considering depending on your computing needs, this will last you for well over a decade, and the only maintenance 
it'll ever require is this. I mean, that's really not a bad deal. Oh, and it is fully Windows 11 compatible. It has the necessary Intel platform trust technology and secure boot options. I tested Windows 11 and it ran great. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed this build as much as I did. If you have any questions, be sure to ask in the comments. Also, be sure to hit that like. It does help get this content out to more people with similar interests and maybe consider subscribing so you don't miss my future content. I do upload a new video at least once a week. For my regular viewers, you know that's typically Sundays. However, for the next month or two, that day may shift as I spend more time enjoying the Colorado summer outdoors with my family. As always, I hope to see you in the next one. Until then, stay safe.